hang on a minute, you got elected because you represented what a lot of people wanted Britain to become. But it hasn't become that. You know, people's big story still is the migrant problem on the southeast uh, corner of this country. And they haven't solved it. You know, if Boris Johnson solves that, he might be all right. But he hasn't solved that. He's now uh, in trouble with uh, with everyone because of what's happened. And I think I don't I don't see him lasting out next year at all. I just don't see it. Mike, I hope, first of all, I hope you don't think me offensive when I say this, but you've been around the media circuit for a wee while now. Yeah. And I think some commentators that are complaining about the likes of talk radio and GB News harming the impartiality of news content and all the rest of it. Do you reckon there's any truth to that? Well, I don't, actually, because we've been suffering, Darren, you and I, um, for you for a lot less time than I have. But for but really since Brexit, because before Brexit, you know, when I was in Fleet Street, the media wasn't in any way connected to the establishment. You know, the media pretty much was the snarling beast that came after people. And they didn't care who you were. They didn't care if you were a celebrity, politician, you know, the prime minister. If you were up to no good, they were going to do you. Now it seems to me that the media, the mainstream media, and I'd say that in knowing that we work for one of the biggest, you know, news agencies and news companies in the world. But, you know, what I would call the mainstream broadcasting media has become very much part of the message that the establishment puts out. And ever since Brexit, they've, they've, they've gone banging on about, you know, the horrible Brexiteers, the racists, the bigots. We all saw how they covered the Freedom Night on the trend of January 31st of last year. Um, and I think it's a very welcome thing to have GB News and to have Talk Radio doing what we do, because if we didn't do it, Nobody would be doing it. You know what gets me as well? I think actually the BBC and Sky, if I pick out two of the other broadcasters, they're guilty of, of the sort of bias that GB News and Talk Radio are accused of, right? They're doing... Mm. They, the, the BBC, for example, you have to meet what I call the three Bs, right? Which are being anti-Boris, anti-Brexit and anti-Britain. Mm. And that's surely... That's taken aside. That's showing a view, isn't it? Yeah, it's exactly absolutely. the same thing that you're accused of. Well, I mean, isn't it hilarious that Andrew Marr decides to have his swan song with the BBC? He says, I must leave the BBC because I'm not allowed to, uh, <laughs> yes. to give my opinion. And you kind of go, are you sure about that, Andrew? And <laughs> apparently the one subject that he hasn't been able to give his opinion about, that he really, really wants to get stuck into, is this something that nobody ever talks about, climate change. And you go, well, you don't, I, wouldn't, I don't think you actually have to leave the BBC to talk about climate change, but you can go to Sky TV where they have a special climate change show every single day where the audience plummets to basically zero because mm. nobody's interested, you know. Mm -hmm. And I think it's fair to say that we at Talk Radio are opinionated. We don't pretend we're not opinionated. You know, we know we are and we say we are, but we also listen to other people who we disagree with. And so, you know, I think that's a very healthy place to be. Exactly, because on that issue, that one issue in particular on the sort of pursuit of net zero, there seems to be a consensus that this is proven science. We're following the science, Mike. You know yeah. that, that phrase that gets bandied about more times than I've had hot dinners. And you just sort of think, well, hang on a minute. Hang on a minute. There are people that have a different view. There are people that actually say what we need to be doing is to be more resilient and actually prepare for mm. a change in climate because it's going to happen regardless of whatever we do because you know china's burning coal at a rate of knots mike and yeah. you just sort of think hang on this is dangerous where dissenting views and opinions and debate and speech are precluded entirely yeah that's right and i mean one of the most frightening uh, phrases to hear uh, is when they say well there's no debate about this you can't debate mm -hmm. it because exactly. everybody knows this is true and you go well, hang on a minute you know, there's a debate about everything as far as I'm concerned. I mean, I will argue with you until the day that I die, until the final hour of the breath leaves my body, I'll be probably dying having an argument with somebody because that's what you do. That's what life is about. And I don't believe uh, anything anybody tells me. I never have. So I got into journalism in the first place. It's always question, question, question. My dad taught me that. You know, he was a working class Scotsman from Glasgow who trained up at art college, ended up working in a newspaper as a graphic artist was a brilliant guy. And he said, you know, treat everybody the same and question everything. And that's the way I live. Um, and that's basically what's wrong with this country because people are not treated the same. What we've seen this week with this horrendous video with the Lake of Stratton and all these sort of uh, tofts in Downing Street, you know, we're being run by people who don't know what Britain is actually like. You mm -hmm. know, they've never been to parts of Britain that, that, that you were brought up in. They don't mm -hmm. really understand them and they don't know what ordinary people's lives are like. And so, 
you know, we have to question everything they, they, they tell us because we don't believe them. Yeah, I mean, I want to get into some of that in a minute, but I, I mean, you've put it perfectly well. You've just described what I would call old-fashioned journalism, Mike. Right? Yeah, that's that's what it used to be. That's yeah. how. Well, it used to be a trade. It. You know, it yeah. used to be something that the ordinary people could get their teeth into. If you had a healthy kind of disrespect for authority, you went to um, a journalism training college. You learned shorthand. Mm -hmm. You learned about the law. You didn't have to go yeah. to Oxford. You didn't have to go to Cambridge. You didn't have to go to university. Now it's very hard to get into newspapers if you don't have a degree. You yeah. know. So they're not attracting the right kind of people. And it was a very honest and a very good trade, you know, going to local courts, covering what was going on in your community. You were really quite an important part of, of that community. That's all gone now, because guess what? The big corporates have bought all the papers and now they're only interested in selling you some rubbish on the Internet. Yeah. I mean, on that point about media bias going back, did you see this Good Morning Britain Twitter poll in which they, I they saw asked? That, that it's it incredible. Removed, yeah? yeah, they asked users of the platform, for people that didn't see it, they asked users of the platform to vote on whether or not because of this Om Omicron variant, it yeah. was time to bring back to or to bring about mandatory vaccination passports and i think it was something like forty five thousand votes mike and of mm. this forty five thousand votes 89 percent of people said no to mandatory vaccinations gmb obviously panicked mike at this stuff and they deleted it immediately this sort of stuff for me is yeah. why it explains why there's so much distrust of the mainstream media in general do you think that's right I think so, because I don't understand why you would do that. I mean, one thing, if you want to run a poll, run a poll, you know, and then report what the poll result is. Why, why would you not want to do that? I mean, I think it's madness to run a poll and then because you don't like what it says, you don't run. It's not journalism. That's mm. political, you know, campaigning, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. And I mean, if we turn then to Boris Johnson, you sort of touched on it there. He's announced this investigation, right? You've been covering this this morning. And he said he'd hand over evidence of any breach of the COVID rules over to the to the police. Do you reckon, Mike, that this this quote unquote investigation is just them trying to kick the controversial can down the road? And this controversial can is, of course, this party that reportedly took place last Christmas in yeah. Downing Street. And we we only know this is true, absolutely true, because of this leaked video to ITV. Do you think this investigation really is just them trying to kick the can down the road, Mike, and hoping that we'll all forget about it? Yeah, I think so, because that seems to be the way that Boris Johnson's sort of policy makers operate. You know, he constantly tries to put the old dead cat on the table and try and move the, the goalpost so that he stop looking at that thing over there. But I think the problem for him this time is that people have seen exactly the timing of this party and they know what they were doing this time last year they know that they were in a terrible place i mean i called her this morning i was nearly in tears listening to her a woman um, who lost her mother um because she wasn't able to get her blood tested properly because covid meant that she couldn't go to hospital she died and she died alone right nobody holding her hand no member of the family anywhere near her they couldn't have a proper funeral you know this woman was was sobbing down the you know the line to me and it was awful to listen to and mm. she said i'll never forgive this government and those and i and i've asked our people to send it to downing street and have a listen to this guys and stop your laughing stop chuckling and stop pretending that it's all a bit of a, a joke and that basically you know those little people out there who don't really understand what we important people do uh, can go and take a running jump and i think people have had enough now and i think when it comes out in the next few days that it that, and this is what we're being told now that there's about another three parties that took place inside of downing street in november there's going to be real problems for boris johnson i think and i think he won't get away with it this time uh, on this police investigation do you reckon boris is looking for a scapegoat as well because ultimately right in my opinion the book has to stop with him, but he, yeah. he is the leader of both the party and the country, and that obviously includes number 10. If he had no clue, which is, seems to be what he's saying here, if he had absolutely no clue of what was going on in number 10 Downing Street, that says quite a lot about him as mm. a leader. Well, we've got a poll going at the moment, and let me tell you, 90% of the people so far, there's a few thousand people, just don't believe what he's saying. Because the mm. trouble with Boris now is he has totally lost all credibility. I don't think anyone really has much faith in him anymore. And when that starts to happen, then to start the skids start to get put under him. The problem, I think, for him um, is that he said that he's going to be, have this investigation. But he's, the way he described it, it sounds to me like he's going to throw some people under the bus. But the problem mm. he's going to have is that Allegra Stratton is Carrie's mate. And everyone, it seems, inside of Downing Street has to be approved by Carrie. So if he starts trying to kill them off, 
it will be an interesting uh, thing to see what happens because at the end of the day, what Keir Starmer should have said to him, which he didn't ask him, was who is it that assured you that no rules were broken? Because he's hiding behind this thing that, you know, last week he was told that there were no rules broken um, and there was no party. This week he's saying, oh, he's discovered that there might have been something that happened, um, but he's been assured that no rules were broken. Yes, he but said, we I, need was to know, yeah, I was but sickened. I was sickened Yeah, this. but we need to know who assured him. You know, who was it that told him that everything was fine? And that's the question that Keir Starmer didn't ask and it should have asked. But I'm also interested in who was there. And I want to see a list of the numbers of people, 50 people supposedly, including some quite prominent journalists, I'm told, which is very interesting because it seems to me that uh, it's taken an awfully long time for this story to come out, considering when it happened and what everybody else was doing. So do you think and there's a sort of um, a, a cartel of a certain media class who mm. is in co total cahoots with the government and they want to be invited back to Carrie's place with the nice wallpaper. Oh, for sure. Is that what Definitely. it's about? I think so, yeah. Well, even today, believe it or not, some guy's written a piece in The Spectator um, about, you know, why everybody's piling on to Lega Stratton and why she hasn't done anything wrong. And, of course, she happens to be married to the political editor of The Spectator. The Spectator. And you mm -hmm. just kind of go around in circles and go, what is wrong with you people? Do you not think we can see what you're doing? Because we can I tell you what, Mike, I, I mean, I've never thought of myself as a conspiracy theorist before, but you start, <laughs> you start to get into all sorts of territory, Listen, don't you? There are, things, there are things that I now say on the radio that if you told me last year, I would say, I would say absolute rubbish. I, I, I wouldn't say that. That's mad. That's completely mad. I mean, I don't go as far as the, you know, Bill Gates wants to control our lives and yes. therefore he's funding the government. 5G. But, I do go as, <laughs> but I do go as far as to say that there is certainly a cabal at the heart of this government which is run by Carrie Simmons, stroke Johnson, whatever you want to call her, because nobody gets into the inner circle unless she approves them. And we saw the reason that Dominic Cummings left, and whatever you might say about Dominic Cummings being a bit of a geek and a bit of a weirdo, I mean, he's one of the people saying there was a party on November the 13th in the Prime Minister's flat, right? Now, if he's found to have been having a party while everybody else was in lockdown, I think he's finished. I think this sort of, I'm glad this has come out, right? Ultimately, I'm mm. glad this has come out because um, I think it exposes that, for me, I've got two points there. It exposes that we, we now know that the government didn't think there was a genuine public health emergency. Because if you did, Mike, if you genuinely believed you've got all the evidence in front mm -hmm. of you and you you genuinely believed that there was this big, nasty virus out there, out and about, you would not have a party. You'd be terrified no. beyond your, wit you'd be at your wit's end, no. wouldn't you? And they so tried this kind of mealy mouth defence, which was that, oh, but they all work together in the same office. Well, hang on a minute. We were told that we couldn't do that. Exactly. Because I couldn't take all the people that I worked with back in December of last year, take them all down to the pub, because guess what? The pub is shut, and you mm. weren't allowed to go with anywhere. You weren't allowed to go around to their house. You weren't allowed to mix. You weren't allowed to have even a, a Christmas with members of your family you didn't live with. Mm. Yeah. I mean, the first point being, you know, they clearly didn't think that there was an emergency, quote unquote, or any justification for mm. denying us all of our Christmas. You know, whether or not it's your last Christmas with granny. I mean, I was tied up, Mark, uh, Mike, rather, in a uh, small flat in Battersea last Christmas. I yeah. didn't see my family. You've listened to people talk all morning about mm. ho worse stories than that uh, that they've had to endure over Christmas because they were sacrificing their Christmas and their time with their family because the government told them there was this public health emergency. And for now, to, to have them turn around, I think it goes to the, to the heart of it, what you just said there earlier, which is that they are so removed mm. from the, the public. They are so removed to how difficult People have found all of this. The mental health implications, yeah. the, the physical health implications. But Mike, I want to know, do you, are you worried about all of this leaking nonsense? Or do you think this is a healthy state of affairs? Yeah. Because well, this, I mean, this talking, video was leaked, right? Yeah, I mean, talking of conspiracy theories, right? There is, there is one currently doing the rounds that this has been leaked by somebody who wants to get rid of Boris because they want mm. somebody who's going to be even tougher on the restrictions. I don't really buy that. I think the point is, is that whenever something gets filmed, whenever something gets recorded, inevitably it gets leaked. I mean, there's a leak uh, out there of uh, Jacob Rees-Mogg at a party, funnily enough, that I was at the other night, Institute of Economic Affairs, which is not the same thing. The lefties are trying to make it into the same thing. Oh, Jacob Rees-Mogg's laughing about, you know, but he's not. What he said was, um, and because I was in a room full of people, that, look, bear in mind, there's no lockdown at the moment, there's no restrictions. I was in a room full of people standing next to each other. And he made this speech where he said, this party will not be reported to the police in a year's time. 
which is not the same in my view, right? Um, and then he said, uh, it's good to see you all social distancing that we've now got the new imperial measurement of two inches as opposed to two meters. It was quite funny, right? But that's not the same as Downing Street aides laughing at something that they had done, which they shouldn't have done, which they knew not to be the right thing to do, which they knew to be illegal, you know? And I think the trouble with doing anything like that and recording anything like that is that it tends to get out. You know, I yeah. mean, it could be somebody in Downey Street who leaked it. I mean, I, I, for example, knew quite a lot about the construction of that um, room that they spent two million quid on. They hired a Russian company, right, mm. to actually fit it out. The same people that fitted out Russia Today studio. And it was a complete shambles. And I've been told by many people who go in and out of Downey Street on a regular basis that the security is not very good. Nobody wears masks. They never have. They've always been sitting very close to one another in the cafe where you can have a cup of tea. You know, they don't do what they tell us to do. They never have. Yeah, uh, well, I'm, exactly. And and I think then it, it goes, again, it goes back to that key central point that keeps being raised, which is that there is a, the sort of, you described them as toffs earlier. I think there's a, in the centre, controlling this number 10 operation, say what you want about Dominic Cummins, but mm. there's a man who on certain aspects of British life, he did opinion poll after opinion yeah. poll focus group after focus group he knows what the british people he's plugged into the british people mm. in a way in which i think the current cabal in number 10 simply aren't and it's, no. this this is what's happened isn't well no because these are these are carrie's people who are sort of the twickenham set you know the kind of zach goldsmith crowd who actually are quite toffee nosed who actually are quite removed and quite privileged and have had very privileged lives and i'm not saying that that should automatically uh, disqualify you from from being in charge of anything but they need a mixture of people they need some ordinary people in there who know what ordinary people think i mean andy colson for example um who is a much derided man went to prison um was the only reason why david cameron had a clue at many points of his administration because andy had been a former newspaper editor um and he was from a relatively uh, ordinary back background in south london and he understood how ordinary people thought um mm. without him uh, he was left with the likes of George Osborne, who didn't have a clue, you know, and then suddenly he spun out of control. And that's, I think, Boris's problem right now is that he doesn't have anyone in there now that Cummings has gone. Um, so sort of tell him, hang on a minute, you got elected because you represented what a lot of people wanted Britain to become. But it hasn't become that, you know, people's big story still is the migrant problem on the southeast uh, corner of this country. And they haven't solved it. You know, if Boris Johnson solves that. He might be all right, but he hasn't solved that. He's now uh, in trouble with uh, with everyone because of what's happened, and I think I don't I don't see him lasting out next year at all. I just don't see it. Do you think would would you go as far as to say he should resign? Well, I think it's going to get worse for him before it gets better. So mm -hmm. I don't think at this point he needs to resign. But if there's any more stuff that comes out in the next couple of days or the next week or so, and don't forget the Sunday papers usually have a good go. Um, I think he's in trouble, definitely in trouble. Mm. I think this is the worst place he's ever been. And he's been in some pretty bad places. People say, oh, he's really good at surviving and recovering. Yeah, but people aren't going to wear more restrictions. People are fed up to the back teeth, you mm -hmm. know, um, and that's going to be a problem for him as well, I think. Because they're now saying, of course, that they're going to bring out the plan B yeah. Which which includes vaccination passports. Yeah. And this strikes me, Mike, as being the, the strategy of throwing a dead cat across the room and hoping yeah. that people are distracted by said dead cat, right? Right. Well, there are two schools of thought. One is that the party is the distraction from the vaccine passports, and the other is that the vaccine passports are the distraction for the party. So you take right, your okay. pick <laughs> of, of those two theories. I mean, I'm not sure if either one of them is true, because I think the party story has come out. I don't think Boris wanted it out there. Um, it doesn't make him look good. It's not to his advantage. Whether or not they want vaccine passports is something I can never understand. I mean, Tony Buxton asked me every week, why are they doing this? And I can't answer it. I don't really know. It doesn't make any sense. You know, mm. why would you look at this variant, which has so far put nobody in hospital whatsoever, and say that it's, it's a worryingly dangerous, you know, variant because it spreads so quickly? Well, if nobody's getting ill, what's the problem? I mean, my son was telling me that they're talking about closing his school because there's so many cases of COVID, but nobody's ill. So you're kind of going, well, what are you closing school for then? It's mad. I, I mean, I, I can't stand that talk of closing schools again, not after what no. we've been reading in the papers recently, Mike, about that poor Ben, about Arthur, oh. Arthur Hughes. I mean, yeah. I, it just, it was utterly heartbreaking. Oh, I couldn't read it. I literally nah, couldn't read it. Nah.
I know, I know. So the, the idea of closing schools, that just, that actually makes me even angrier than this, you mm. know, banter about a piss yeah. up in number 10. Yeah, exactly. Well, as, as I think it was, um, what's his phrase? I can't remember the impressionist. Um, Rory Bremner said, you know, yeah. well, obviously, if there was a piss up in Downing Street, you know, Boris couldn't have organised it, which is quite funny <laughs> when you think about it. <laughs> yeah, I like that. <laughs> so, I mean, but, but it's, I mean, we've allowed, it's funny enough, um, the, one of the last people I spoke to on the show today said, we've allowed the political class of this country to kind of become managers, and we're no longer led by inspirational figures. I mean, I saw a great piece by David Blunkett the other day um, about how he stopped listening to Radio 4 because yeah. he's become so woke. And I thought to myself, you know, I never thought I'd long for the days of somebody like David Blunkett to be Home Secretary, but he was so much better than the people we have now. We just seem to have a bunch of kind of stuff, stuffed shirts. I mean, you look at Matt Hancock, who still seems to think that he, that people want him to come back into public life. He keeps writing for the Mail on Sunday, telling us that, you know, he gets stopped in the street all the time. You know, which if that happens, you know, I'm the king of Prussia. You know, the only reason you stop Matt Hancock in the streets is to tell him he's a twat, if I'm allowed <laughs> to say that on your show. You are, but, yes. So, you know... Um, I just, you know, we've, we've, we've sort of inherited this ghastly crowd and I blame the Blair administration for sort of kicking it off that we started appointing people who were friendly and got on with the prime minister. You know, we used to have governments where the cabinet rule was at each other's throats, you know, didn't all agree on everything, but now you can't get into the cabinet unless you sort of sign in blood the fact that you're never going to disagree with the prime minister. Yeah, well, exactly, exactly. And I mean, this, it strikes me, right, that I, so if you'd asked me a week ago if I thought Boris Johnson would, wouldn't would make it to the next parliament, I'd have said, no, Howie, you know, he's he'll be fine. Yeah. They, he'll be fine yeah. here. But now I'm sort of thinking someone is clearly out to get him, right? And there is, it seems to be little by little, they'll just put out these little nuggets yeah. and they start to chip away. At, because the only reason, let's be honest, let's be frank, the only reason that Boris Johnson is in number 10 Downing Street is because the Conservative Party, Parliamentary Party, have concluded that he will win them power. Once yes. that starts to look a bit shaky, Mike, once the North Shropshire by-election mm. results are out on Thursday, who knows how, how they're yeah. going to turn out now, it starts to look a, a lot more uncertain as to whether mm. or not he is capable of keeping them in power, doesn't it? Yeah. And I think it's quite interesting as well what's happening inside the Tory party itself, because I think the red wall seats have come into sort of power. And that has an awful lot to do with Boris's strength in, 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 in sort of numbers that he's got this 80 seat majority. But an awful lot of those young MPs have come in and we know quite a lot of them at all already because they're quite vocal. They're not like traditional sort of shire Tories. You know, they're not the old farmers and the, the, the sort of the landowners of, of old. They're younger people who might have had actual proper jobs. They're quite interesting people. Um, they're not welcomed, apparently, into the fold in Downing Street or necessarily in Westminster because they're not sort of seen as clubbable, you know, and there's quite a lot of women as well. Um, and I think that there's a kind of split emerging now in the Tory party where they need to find their way, because let's face it, the, problem for, the other problem for Boris Johnson is that he's taken the Conservative Party into places that it should never be. You know, the highest tax country now, uh, the highest tax nation, sorry, since the war, you know, we've never paid more taxes we're spending more money than any government's ever spent. And I know that coronavirus is to, is to blame for a lot of that. But still, you know, he's spending money and taxing us in a way that no Tory prime minister should be doing. You know, and people are not going to like that because once we see our money disappearing, you know, once we get to the next tax rise in, in April, and people start noticing. I mean, I've started to notice and I'm lucky enough not to have to worry too much about it. But I've started to notice the price of petrol. I mean, I put petrol in my car the other day. It was about 78 quid. To fill it, the last time I did it, it was about 65. And, you know, stuff like that starts to get to people. Christmas is going to be expensive. Energy prices are going through the roof. And, and, and it's, you know, the economy is stupid, as Bill Clinton used to say, is a very important phrase, you know? Well, exactly. And that, that, so that reminds me of, of what's been happening up here, with, where you've got people charging their, their mobile phones and things through uh, their, their cars, essentially, yeah. because they've not right. got access to power and haven't had for... 11 days or so that's and a shocker that i mean is, the fact that we it, can't seem to fix that is ridiculous. i know i know it's incredible and it says i i would rather we have an inquiry into the infrastructure in areas like this mike mm. where we're we're just not having those conversations but we're not going to have that because we're focusing on this thing now and i'm wondering then it strikes me that the the problem here 
fundamentally is that you have, as you mentioned, those Red Wall Tory MPs who I'm sure I get it, who understand these things, but they're not in a real position of power at the moment. No. You've got the people like Carrie, who is at the heart of government, who focuses on this net zero stuff. You've got the goldsmiths focusing on this net zero stuff. Mike, it's going to be utterly immiserating for working class people around this mm. country. Why the hell would you expect working class people to vote to make themselves poorer, essentially, mm. which is what yeah. they're going to do in the pursuit of net zero? Exactly right. And nobody really cares. You know, if you ask people, it's one of those questions, you know, if you ask people um, if we should house the homeless or if we should give more money to charity or if we should save the planet, everybody always says yes. But as soon as you say, well, can you give us a tenner? They go, um, no, actually, because I've got to look after my own family. You know, would you like a heat pump installed in your house? Well, I can't really because I only live in a flat and I haven't got the space to put it in and I've got no garden. What would you like an electric car? for 50 grand no i can't afford it i've got to buy one i had some people ring me the other day they said we've got we've got to buy a new car second hand our budget six thousand pounds that's a lot of money to some people you know but if you showed that to carrie and her rich mates in downing street they'd all fall about laughing and go imagine imagine buying a car for six grand that mm -hmm. doesn't even pay me for for a week's holiday in the maldives you know or or to fully wallpaper down in street <laughs> <laughs> no and this is it i mean we li we live now in a, in a land which is terribly uh, ribbon, I think, by by the haves and the have-nots, and the haves have now got more money than they've ever had, and the have-nots have got less than they've ever had. You know, I mean, I know that it's ridiculous to compare us to Victorian society, and, and poverty now is not as bad as it was. But there's a lot of poverty, and you you know it, I know it. I mean, I I was on my way up to Scotland last Christmas, uh, actually no, Christmas before, um, and um, you know we stopped off in Wigan for the night because we had to take a take a stop on the way. And it was horrendous, you know, the mm. poverty that you could see, the, the, the teenagers hanging about on street corners, the needles in the in the little park where I went to walk the dog, you know, the drug abuse. And it's just, you know, I don't think anyone in Downing Street has a clue about that. No, I know, I know. It's it's about not being in touch with the British people. And when a government mm. falls out of touch with the people it purports to represent, you've got a real problem. You have. Yeah, definitely. So ultimately, then, how do you see this all playing out? Would, uh, is it a case of we're just waiting about if there's anything more, he's had it, essentially. Uh, if there isn't anything more, he clings on and we get through this. And does the Tory party then turn around and say, why, this man is a born winner and we've got to keep him? Mm. I think there are two things that have to happen for him to go. First of all, we have to see what the, in the we, we, as far as I know, he wasn't at this party that Allegra Stratton was laughing about. So he's OK with that. But if it turns out he was at another one, which took place in November when everyone was on lockdown, I think he's got a problem. Um, yeah. And then I think the people behind him will say and the people on the Tory party will say, well, you know, you've now you've now actually broken the rules yourself and you'll have to go. Because in the end, that's what happened to Dominic Raab. You know, he didn't break any rules as such, but he was he was missing in action when Afghanistan happened. He got moved, you know, um, and in the end, you just go, well, you're not really doing your job very well. So I'm afraid you're going to have to do something else. And as much as they might like Boris Johnson to win the next election for them, that's quite a long way off. And if they're going to win the next election without him, they need to put somebody in that people start to like and start to trust. And I wonder if that's not Liz Truss. Well, yeah, I think a lot of especially Conservative Party members mm. are starting to ask that very question. I mean, she's the polling numbers for her. She's she's more popular than bloody Chairman Mao, yeah, right? She, exactly she, right. And also she, her track record is that she does everything quite quietly. She gets on with it. She doesn't make a fuss. I mean, the problem for Boris, right? And I was getting messages from some of my women friends today while he was making his defence of, uh, of what this party business was. And they were like, is he just telling lies like he does to all of his all of his wives? You know, it's almost like he was he was caught out on a night out, um, you know, shagging the wrong woman. And he's kind of, he's kind of going, oh, I didn't know. I didn't know it was wrong. You know, I, 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 have, to do, I have to do an inquiry and find out, you know, what was happening because he's been lying to everyone all his life. And I mean, as much as it pains me to say that, that's what that's the guy he is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, Mike, I think that's the perfect way to, to end today's discussion. Thank you so much for giving up your time. Not at all. Good to see uh you. Have a lovely Christmas. No matter uh, what. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, well, by, the, by, I by the time this by the time this goes out, we might be in plan B. <laughs> well, exactly. Where we might be, yeah. That yeah. Boris Johnson's dead cat. 
Chlora yeah. that way. <laughs> oh no, Night nightmare. Thank you so much for watching this video. Reasoned is a grassroots organisation that's entirely funded by people like yourself. So if you're in a position to do so, please do consider supporting us by clicking the link to the side there.